believe the previous, um, the keynote actually set us up for this conversation because regulation came up into thinking about it and regulation is one of the structural interventions. So today I am excited for a conversation where we'll be talking about the structural interventions to understand their impact and what opportunities they present. Joining me on this panel is Bridget Andere, Senior Policy Analyst at Access Now, based in Nairobi, working in building human rights, centered digital rights policy through advocacy and research. Welcome, Bridget. Next, we have Bright Simons. Oh, Simmons. Simmons, thank you. Uh, a technologist, policy analyst, social innovator, and an activist working at the intersection of the theory and practice of change making with a particular focus on systems building. Welcome, Bright. And then we have Pumzile Bandam, <laughs> an award winning independent consultant expert in combating disinformation, advocating for digital rights, and driving platform accountability. Welcome, Pumzile. And then lastly, we have Sean. Sean, Sean Pather is a professor of information systems at the University of Western Cape, South Africa, who works on ICT for D interventions towards reduced digital inequalities in Africa. Welcome, Sean. So before we begin, we will be taking questions from the audience after the panel conversation. So please join the discussion afterwards and do jot down those thoughts that will be coming up as we have this conversation. Right, so let's get into it. So my first question will actually be to Sean. And this is a question that all of them will be answering, but from their different perspectives. What are the realities of implementing structural interventions to address the AI gaps? Good afternoon. Thank you, Chene. Um, as I think about structural interventions, I think first and foremost, we have to understand that there's always been a value proposition from technology. So if we go back to 2001, when the UN first declared that there shall be a world summit, that world summit agreed not just about, the, about access to, to broadband internet and technologies, but about the inherent value proposition to it for development. 20 odd years later, the 2023 whistles is still saying the same thing. But the issue as we think about structural interventions is that if we're gonna think of ICTs as a catalyst for development, if we think about the most recent of technological development, which is AI, and as we discuss the biases and as we discuss the harms, but we also gotta recognize there is inherently a value proposition. So from a structural perspective, the first and most important issue for me is that we don't take our eye off the ball. Our eye on the ball has to remain in relation to that of the digital divide. Now, so before we even get to the issues of AI, if we don't sort that out, then in other words, we are dealing right now with the symptoms, the underlying cause, as we talk about structural interventions around AI, is that of the digital divide. The data, I and mean, I think we all know the data is quite outstanding, uh, um, uh, not outstanding, but disappointing. We've made very little progress over a number of years, despite a lot of investment. Um, if you look at the least developing countries, um, I've, I've got all the data here, I'm, for example, just to say that Europe, Commonwealth countries, America is approaching 80 to 90 percent. We agree that universal access is about 95 percent. But if you look at the least developing countries, they're still sitting at 36%. And even that is not a reality. A lot of work I do in rural areas of South Africa around connectivity tells us that all of this data, which is computed from SIM card ownership and, and, and network penetration, doesn't tell us about actual use, actual reach and productivity, whether there is development taking place on the presence of the internet. So, the first, and for, the first underlying factor for me in thinking about structural intervention, and I'll talk about some of the mitigation ideas later on in the panel, is to refocus our attention on the underlying cause that is preventing us from realizing the benefits. So for as long as we have large numbers, 2.7 billion of the people in the world right now, 
outside of the internet, we are going to continue not to be able to reap any benefits from AI. And we're going to continue to have an unevenness, we're going to continue with the bias, we're going to continue with the injustices that are perpetuated through AI applications. So Chair, I think that first and foremost, that's where we need to cast our eyes uh, so that we can bring, bring about what I call uh, an even data infrastructure and, and a more even data representativeness across the world. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sean, for that reminder. Um, the conversation has been happening 20 odd years ago and more, and the point is still the same. So how do we shift? Um, and I'll bring it on to Bridget. I think, Bridget, with what Sean has been saying is the reality of trying to close the existent inequalities with people not having access. I would like to hear your reflections when we have structural interventions that you know, see the use of technology, particularly we've seen the increased uptake of surveillance cameras as part of security interventions by African governments. What is the reality of then including um, AI-based or data-driven technologies? Yeah, thanks, Chennai. And I think, you know, the first thing that we need to kind of come to a head with as we start to have this conversation is that AI is not just generative AI. It's not just chat GPT. It's not a fancy little app where you put in your photo and it generates a, another picture of you looking like a warrior. That's not all AI is. There's so many other uses of AI in this region around the world that affect our day-to-day -day lives. And the reality is that we're all affected differently by these AIs. And so, you know, when I think about AIs, uh, uh, you know, as a policy person or as a person that focuses on advocacy and uh, the human rights surrounding any form of tech, really, uh, I start thinking about who are the most affected, who are the people at the margins. And so you look at how certain programs are deployed, and especially within the global majority, wherever they come from, because the reality also is that a lot of these programs are not developed in-house. They're not developed for us, with us in mind. They're not developed with the person at the margins most in mind. They're developed with some random person seated somewhere in a place of privilege in mind who can use it in the most effective way possible. Um, and so when we're thinking of regulation, and the reality is that, of course, a lot of people who develop these uh, technologies will say that regulation will stifle innovation, we shouldn't regulate too much. Absolutely, there is definitely a risk of over-regulation with anything. But the reality is that when they come into this region, have we given enough consideration into how they will affect us as a people? Um, and you've mentioned surveillance, for instance. A lot of AI models, as they're conceived, you know, uh, collect a lot of biometrics, collect a lot of data, and then of course they will say, but there is a data protection provision in whatever country that we're deploying in. Absolutely, no problem. But have you taken into consideration everything that needs to be taken into consideration? The people that this thing will govern. Um, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, there was a program that was released, uh, a little website, if I could remember the name, I would share it, unfortunately it don't, and it basically played on predictive policing whereby you would enter a specific set of circumstances uh, and it would tell you just how high risk the police would see you as, as a citizen. Me, who has never hurt a fly, I was categorized as high risk. Wow. Why? It's because I'm black. It's because I'm from Africa. When you look at even generative AI, the really cool stuff that people really like to use to make a little nice picture of themselves that they can share on the internet looking like a warrior. Many women reported around the world, Latina women, Afro-Latina women, women of color generally, reported that whenever they generated these photos, most of them came back nude. This was not happening with white people, generally, as a rule. So, most of these programs have not been conceptualized for us. So when we're regulating them, we need to take this into consideration that these programs are not built for us, but we are adopting them. And so when we adopt them, and especially with, you know, with regard to um, uh, taking care of social welfare, or you know, taking care of policing, or taking care of security, we have to ensure 
that it doesn't cause more harm, and especially the collection of biometrics with application in, bio, uh, in you know, predictive policing, application when it comes to social welfare, something that is supposed to be more helpful, more often turns into something that is extremely harmful, and it will not harm the people who are sitting in a place of privilege. It will not probably harm someone like me who can find another way to do things. It will harm the people that have no other choice. It will harm the people who are most at the margins. It will harm communities that are not necessarily falling into you know, the binaries of what we think is right and is not right, what is positive or is not positive. Thank you so much for that, Bridget. I think um, Bridget and I are probably on the same TikTok <laughs> where we get the generative AI and we think it's cute. But the reality is the harm that exists when the technology is not built with us in mind, but we are the test cases. So thank you so much uh, for framing that in that instance. And I'll move on to Pumsele. Pumsele, um, you know, Bridget has talked about regulation, right? And we've also seen a lot of conversation around ethical practices. From your experience, what is, how does that, what's the reality of having that intervention where governments or regulators are then guided by ethical practices? What are the realities that you see in your work? Sure. I'd like to take a step back um, and answer some questions which I think uh, there's a lot of kind of misinterpretation of. So is all AI evil? No, it's not all evil. Um, I think when people think AI, they think robots, end of days, and there's lots of alarmism, um, which misses out on the important issues we need to be discussing. There are many great benefits for AI to Africa, agri-tech, medical tech, um, and we really should be having access to those technologies. But what is important is that when those technologies are deployed, they do not cause harm. So I think a lot has been spoken about legislation, about regulation, and that needs to happen. Um, and I think a lot of African countries are behind. So for me, if there was a regulatory body for Africa, what the EU is doing is amazing. Um, they really kind of properly exercise platform accountability. Um, social media platforms, for example, know that they can't go to Europe and mess around. Um, they can't do that because fines in the billions would be handed out. So I think we really as a continent need to unite and make sure that there's proper platform accountability. And a second point I think is that we can't talk platform accountability without having companies around the table. You need to have them around the table. So I think the relationship, it's very fractured where you know, tech companies are viewed as evil and civil society people are probably viewed by social media, by platforms in general as you know, busy bodies who just like to complain. So in terms of ethics, I think the interventions are often late where it comes at a stage for, of regulation where the technology has already been built. I would suggest that ethics are built in at the design process. Um, so at design, we consider ethics. Uh, and those ethics aren't necessarily only human rights, um, which kind of answers legal questions. Uh, and the, the platforms can say, you know, there's a consent policy, you agree to it, um, you agree to have your data harvested. We need to look at human well-being, uh, which is a psychosocial consideration, where we're looking at, is this um, AI tool going to cause mental health issues? Uh, is this algorithm going to perpetuate social divides? Is it going to, you know, wh what are those negative impacts? So those kind of considerations need to be implemented at the beginning. And then there's a question of who, who does the accountability? If those ethics are in place, which body then, uh, you know, makes sure that those ethics are properly implemented in the design? I think that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I think it's easy with legalities. Well, it's not easy, you know, you can take it to court, but it's actually a solution that's inaccessible for many people. You know, it's class action lawsuits. You're going up against big companies with a lot of money. So it's not a properly accessible solution. So I would like to see the industry itself adopt ethical standards for AI design and deployment and implementation. 
uh, and there be an industry-wide agreement that these are the values that we find important. Transparency, we need to be very clear about what these tools are and our users are very clear about what kind of information is being given out. We're not gonna write 20 page long consent policies and very heavy language. I think even for all of us in this room, we probably don't always all read those policies. We just assume, okay. So it needs to be an accessible language. There needs to be an accountability mechanism saying if you do not, as the tech industry, um, you need to be doing this. And if you do not meet the standard, you will be fined whatever huge amount. Um, so this is over and above what regulators need to be doing. So I think the industry itself needs to do some soul searching um, and accept that the world has moved on from a conception of business where it's just go in there, maximize profit, whatever happens, not your problem. And kind of accept that the world has moved on to a stage where it's not purely about profit. Um, it's about making sure that you do not harm the social, economic, political relations in a country. Uh, and you can still, we're not saying don't make profit, go ahead, make profit. But just understand that there are negatives and they need to have a seat at the table and come forward and say, these are the ethics, this is what we're going to do. Um, and we are going to be far more responsible in, in, in implementing and building AI systems. Thank you so much, Pumzle. Um The soul searching. <laughs> um, it would really be curious because sometimes we see it's a lot of big egos, as we've seen with the changes that have happened on uh, social media platforms where people used to get information to make evidence-based uh, interventions, and now everyone has to pay to have access. Um, it's ridiculous. And so in this context, okay, so we've done a little bit of like, it's really sad out there right now with the uh, interventions around tech. I want to actually bring the question to someone who has done something, building uh, technical solutions, but also as a person who I would consider a unicorn and understanding the policy context as well and the reality of structural interventions. So, Bright, ta-da. Thank um, you, John. My question to you as someone who's built uh, technological solutions and if you can just share with the audience what these have been um, how does it work in terms of like coming up with a technical intervention for a problem you've seen in a context as someone who's building as an African for Africans and how it navigates in the system of the policy gaps and um, evidence gaps that your fellow panelists have highlighted Th thank you Chennai so first you, you mentioned I should say a few things about um, the work that I've been doing in technology as a technologist. So we built a platform to try and address supply chain problems in life-touching products. So medicines, agro-inputs, cosmetics, that kind of thing. And some of the use of AI grew really interesting. For example, by using um, a machine learning algorithm to scan the packaging of fake products over a long period of time, we built an algorithm that upon a subsequent scanning, of a potentially or a suspected fake product could give you a prediction whether or not that item was potentially fake, uh, was uh, likely to be fake or not. So we've deployed these kind of solutions to the point where at one time in Nigeria, we were using AI algorithms to try and predict where counterfeiting breach is likely to occur. So by counterfeiting, I mean products that look like genuine products, but they're actually not genuine products. So you buy a medicine, a pack of medicine, a place like Guinea, and uh, earlier on in this decade, 66% of the time, you'll be getting a fake product, which means the medicine that you've bought for your child will not work um, due to the fact that the ingredients in there are not the right ingredients. So we were building an AI system to try and predict where in the supply chain you are likely to see the most breaches and what are the interventions that are likely to work. So that's by way of um, um, a skin in the game, why, why I have some views to share in this matter. I think the problem in having this discussion, to my mind, it's three knowledge vacuums. There are three knowledge vacuums that are really important to address. One, you need a simple technical framework that allows you to organize what is indeed a very vast, complex, and fast-evolving field like AI. It's just, otherwise, it's just too complex. So you need a simple technical framework that allows you to organize your thoughts when you encounter that particular phenomenon. So that's number one, and I'll explain in a moment what kind of tech framework this could be. Number two, 
most people are heavily, maybe blissfully, unaware of how much regulation of AI nowadays itself is dependent on infrastructure. What I mean is that you can't regulate AI unless you have a certain technical proficiency to regulate AI. In a way, it's a bit like finance, but way more so. The degree of technical infrastructure that you need to actually regulate AI means that many African countries, to my mind, are just not set up at this point to regulate AI. The third knowledge vacuum is that a lot of people think of government as a kind of neutral arbiter. I think in pharmaceuticals, in certain aspects of agro, agro uh, industry, you can make that assumption. The government is some kind of neutral arbiter that allows you know, a, number, a set of principles in a way to take effect. I think in AI, and the way we're going to see it evolve over time, the government is going to be an active player. And that changes the dynamic around regulation. So let me go into this a little bit more. The technical framework that I have adopted, and which I will try to urge you to adopt when you are trying to think about AI, is to think of three elements or three legs of a tripod. The first leg is what most of you are really familiar with, which is the algorithms, the programs, the software program that does some thinking or reasoning and has some capacity that is close to the human baseline. So think of AI as any software algorithm that has some potential to be close to the human baseline in performing any task. The second leg is to think about the data. And the data will be you know, various data sets and wherever it is that you may find them in different ways. So biometric data, data from telematics, you know, telecom data, and the rest of it. The third leg, which I think is the least understood, and nonetheless the most important, is the integrations that allow the data to meet the algorithm. And in the case of AI in particular, most models, whether it's GP3, BERTS, COCO, etc., are a fusion of the algorithm and the data. So you take a lot of data, you run it through a certain algorithm over time, and then you get a certain model, which is like a simplified version of the data in the universe. Now, why is this framework important? This framework is really important because I think a lot of people get confused when they think of AI, they think of it entirely in terms of the algorithms, which lead to some complications. One, the algorithms are not growing as fast as people think, and they're not growing as powerful as people think. I'll give you a practical example. Between 2021 and 2022, some of the best performing image detection and image segmentation algorithms, basically those things that lets you look at a cat and tell you this is a cat or something like that, the improvement for some of the best was about 0.17%, 0.1% over that year period, over that one year period. What this is called technically saturation. We are at a point where the algorithms are not growing that efficiently. Secondly, the discrete capabilities of the algorithms are not as frightening as people think. I'll give you a practical example. In drug discovery, which people think is going to be completely revolutionized by AI, there's not been a single drug discovered through AI, which has passed phase three. The one that came closest to it passed phase two and filled phase three in some really interesting ways, which I don't have time to go into. Think of port automation. It will surprise you to know that only 4% of ports in the world have some degree of AI automation, and none of them are fully automated. Even though when you think of port automation, moving containers off ships and then moving them into trucks, it looks like a perfect example. The reason why this is, is that while the individual algorithms already exceed human capability in many dimensions, so if you think of the ability to answer a visual question, is this a cat or is this a, a, a cross between a monkey and um, a cat, AI already out outperforms humans. But that is not how you solve problems in the real world. In the real world, the different algorithms need to talk to each other and need to be integrated in order to address real tasks. And it's that connection among the algorithms and the data sets where all the magic happens. But to connect the algorithms together and to connect the algorithms to the data, you need rules. Rules that allow you access. So one last example in that regard. Think of how we got ChatGPT. Most of ChatGPT is based on something called C4, which is a giant collection of data all over the internet. So they picked up all manner of data and they mashed it together and got this algorithm to try and think through a single corpus. Now, to be able to achieve that, you need rules that gives you access to data sets you don't control. Because you cannot have all the data. So you don't own Wikipedia, you don't own IMBD, you don't own a bunch of things. 
but with the right rules, you can collect and consolidate data across the region. Now, my argument is that a lot of people misunderstand that third element of integrations. And the rule sets that allow you to get access to algorithms you didn't develop, and data sets you didn't collect. To my mind, that would detect everything in AI. Who writes those protocols? Who writes those mechanisms? And they would be so important that if we don't pay attention to that element, no matter what we do on the regulation front, we'll get it wrong. So that's the first issue. The second issue, and I know I'm running out of time, is that when it comes to this challenge around infrastructure as being critical to doing regulation, it's really straightforward. To tell if a particular AI algorithm is biased or is likely to foster discrimination, what you actually have to do is to audit it and to do so in a continuous fashion. The funny thing, though, is that how you audit it is through similar algorithms and data sets. You actually have to build another model to regulate the model you want to regulate. And you need another data set to determine whether somebody's using a swear word or not. So when you, by the time you think it through, every single regulatory function is dependent on another technical function, which is why unless we have capacity in the technical domain, we cannot do regulation at all. Thank you so much, Bright. I think that also grounds us into the reality of like, it needs to be multidisciplinary if we're going to have structural interventions. We cannot do it on our own. And I think this panel is representative of that idea. MOSFIST is representative of that idea. And Mozilla's own ethos around open to ensure open source um, voice data sets, for example, so that people can build, assess those data sets to see if they make sense. So. Um, oh, and I also wanted to say, I remember when I started looking at artificial intelligence uh, and I knew nothing, and someone said, AI has the greatest salesperson because someone can sell you an Excel sheet and tell you it's AI. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I actually want to just throw it back to my panelists. If there are any reflections that struck up for you from what has been said before, and um, Sean, I'm going to come back to you because I think the data aspect or you know, having that information is so important. And with the, when you spoke about digital inequality, um, what, is, what are the challenges of actually getting the data that allows for us to have these informed interventions to build the solutions? And I think this is part of what Bright was talking about um, in the intervention he provided. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Chennai. So, uh, and so I think it's a good point for me to pick up from, from Bright's very detailed explanation of the inner workings. So the issue is that as long as large spades of society are outside, as Bright has pointed out, data is the lifeblood. So we need to deal with the, with the digital divide problem so that we create um, the data infrastructure to enable data representativity. Because all of these algorithms are gathering and mining and crawling all over through publicly available to, to produce answers according to the algorithm rules. But if that data is not representative, if we have currently just 2.7 billion outside who are not connected, there's no digital data flowing, let alone the others who are so-called connected but who are not even using the network in some kind of a meaning, meaningful way. It will tell you how underrepresentative all of the data being used by all of the different applications. Um, so I think that's first and foremost. And for me, we need to keep our eye on the ball in terms of how do we actually come back to grassroots. So models such as community networks, such as I work in, in, in South Africa, and I think there are many other good examples in Africa, are the ways in which we can fast track expanding the, at least at the infrastructure level, We've learned a few other things along the way. Um, so firstly, the regulation around easing up access. Kenya is a very good example. Uganda, Uganda, Ethiopia, South Africa just has an amendment now to enable other modes, innovative modes, such as community networks to bring people into the digital, uh, bring them into the information society. We are demonstrating in our Zenzeleni project that you can provide internet access at under $2 a month to poor people. So I think we need to um, get back to that. So it's a, it's a long process, but if we can enable people to come into the data infrastructure, we will have data representativeness. And then, as Pumzile said, we 
potentially there is benefit to be got out of AI. But first and foremost, we need to have this data representativity. And as long as we don't do that, then we are going to continue to have the prejudicial outcomes that we are talking about at, at MozFest. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd just like to speak to two points, uh, two very important points I think Bright and Sean have made. So number one is what I call, perhaps a little bit rudely, take a literacy amongst in government. Um, I remember when I was a politician, I was in parliament, and I was trying so hard to push, I was in the communications portfolio, communications and digital technologies committee, and I was trying so hard to push the committee to talk about technology, to look at uh, platform accountability, to hold social media platforms accountable. Um, I succeeded in, you know, getting the, the social media platforms to come to the table. So that is definitely a very big problem. Because since I've left, there's been no talk around the digital space. So just we need from data is we need to know who is saying what on which platform how many of them are saying it how what's the virality of that piece of information uh, what are the different communities in that social media space who are the key uh, influences in those in those different uh, communities so without access to that data there's very little we can do to combat disinformation um, so yeah I think I don't know what the solution is, but I, I really would like to see the global community, if they want to help Africa, it's data access, data, data, data. We need that data. There's very little we can do without it. I don't know what that was. Okay, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, um, I will just say one thing uh, that has come up a couple of times in the last couple of minutes, that um, you know there is a need to capacitate, and lawmakers don't have enough capacity or knowledge. This excuse is tired. 
we're not gonna say that anymore. And you know, specifically even saying that it's an African problem, it's not an African problem. Because the reality is that even before AI regulation was done in the EU, this was something that was said, that MEPs don't have enough knowledge, they don't have enough capacity. But the reality is that these models are being deployed anyway. You know, uh, automated decision making is creeping into our everyday lives to determine who receives social welfare, who receives government housing. So whether or not they have the capacity or the knowledge, that's none of our business and they need to actually develop it. If they don't have it, then develop it. There's such a robust um, industry and, you know, such a, a big group of well-read people and knowledgeable people that the governments and policymakers can tap into. And even the tech companies, because I think when we're talking about policy, a lot of the time we fall into this trap of thinking, you know, it's government that needs to develop policy, but it's not only governments that need to develop policy. Even these companies that develop these um, systems should have policies, should have frameworks. So then how are we supposed to say that they're super technical people who are developing this framework, who are developing these systems, don't have the knowledge or capacity to develop these frameworks. And you know, this is one of the things that we need to think about even as we think about how to intervene structurally and policy-wise. It's not only governments. That's the kind of like aha moment, that it's not only governments that need to develop policies and frameworks. The people that are developing these things, it starts at that level. It doesn't need to get to a level where now it's only regulation by government, by policy makers, that is the solution. It's also where it's coming from. At the very beginning of it, at the conceptualization of how these systems are developed, those policies need to be developed at that level as well. Um, I think that's so important. Sometimes we can have these conversations and look at the obvious, which sometimes can be government. And I think, Pumzile, particularly when you mentioned the groundswell and what you just mentioned, that it's people, I remember how uh, expensive the internet was in South Africa. And through uh, Twitter, at that time it really was Twitter, uh, <laughs> mobilization and radio DJs, um, the, it was data must fall and everything it, it brought about the everything must fall movement But it helped and I think it, it's it's that groundswell that had parliamentarians and I remember um, <laughs> Facebook and Google at that time were willing to come to Parliament <laughs> to respond to questions and I think that is because they knew it was a market and they needed to respond. So that groundswell of people getting movements and all of in, in that response does help them to say, hey, where's the capacity that needs to be done? People are saying something. You've been elected into position to respond. You, uh, you builder, come into the space and respond. So I want to bring it to Bright so that we get ready to open up for questions. So I know some of you have uh, a thousand questions. I hope you do. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, right, was around rules. And I think the component around rules is so important because it's like um, they provide a framework of practice. It's something that um, was mentioned by Daniel when you spoke about, you know, you have laws so that you can have some process where people can be held accountable. And when you mentioned rules, it really made me think as the conversation is happening, what are some of the rules that we can have in place so that it's not just one particular group of people intervening, but is actually something that all of us can take a look at and say, hey, Rule 13 says this is how we need to engage. Um, what do you think about that? No, thank you, Chennai. I think, like, like uh, as I said, I'm in the technology, so I think algorithmically. And for me, it's a four-step process um, of getting to a point where some of the discussions that we've had here can have real impact on the ground. I think number one, there is an English saying that if you take care of the pennies, the pounds will take care of themselves. It's not always true, uh, but <laughs> it's a good starting point. The basics are very important, and I think sometimes we ignore the basics. Only about 0.7% of global general articles on AI are written in Africa by Africans. That is much smaller than our share of global trade. We are inching towards 3% of global trade. So 0.6% means that compared to our economic contribution, which is small, by the way, we, our AI contribution is about a fifth. 
20% of our econo general economic contribution. That's clearly room for growth. Those basics have to be grappled with head on. The second point, I think, is that before we do any kind of regulatory thinking, it helps to be clear what is our ideological framework. If you look at the EU AI Act that Bridget mentioned a while ago versus the Chinese version of AI Act, there's fundamental difference. The Europeans are all about prescription, what you must not do, what is high risk, what you must avoid. The Chinese are equally prescriptive and prescriptive. AI must advance labor dynamics. AI must advance national interest. AI must do so and so. That's a very different way of rulemaking. I don't understand why Burundi will want to do AI regulation if it has absolutely no commitment whatsoever to any ideological positioning as to how technology must behave. I don't get it. I think you must start off from what do we understand about AI, how the world is evolving, what is our place in it, what are the geopolitical dynamics, and then here is our regulation. A lot of the regulatory work that has been done in AI across Africa is donor-driven, very little local ownership. Nobody has sat down and said, look, given our history with technology, starting from the internet and access and the rest of it, here is where we've landed. So here is how we think of AI. Number three, we need joined up thinking. I look at some data residency rules in Africa, and they don't make sense. If you tell me that you're not going to allow data to move out of Uganda or Eritrea or Mauritania, and yet still, because of the fact that you don't have local infrastructure, the vast majority of your people use cloud services, which means that they are backing up all their data in the cloud, and the data is already sitting in San Francisco, then what is the point of a data residency law? They are using Microsoft for uh, Gmail. They are using uh, Google for backup of data. They are using some Amazon Web Service or some other thing. And yes, you have a data residency rule. All the data is already in San Francisco. I don't get it. So there has to be joined up thinking where we understand what we are trying to achieve. And the strategy has to be based on a conversation within industry and government and between the two. So that the best ideas win through real debate. Last point, I think he's right, Bridget, when she says that we have to do the, find the capacity anyway because, you know, this is with us. But I think that it, the strategy in terms of how we do it matters and it's really about strategic commitment. I was surprised when I was looking at the actual cost for some of the most fascinating um, language models that we have today, the ones that are, you know, having all the rave, the GP3s and the rest. And I learned that actually training costs for GP33 was in the order of $1.8 million. That is something MTN could easily pay for. It's, it's, it's the cost of a conference for MTN, right? Now, my thinking is that it's not really there for about costs. It's, about, it's always been about strategic commitment. African multinationals, the big African technology companies, never had a strategic commitment to invest in the ecosystem. I remember those days when I used to go and fight with telecom companies in Africa over short codes and how you have to allow a flourishing ecosystem of startups. And they wouldn't budge. They wanted to make all the money upfront. There was very little attempt to say, look, we are going to consciously cultivate a startup community which will extend our technology. And I think that lack of strategic commitment is a problem. Last point, startups often want to own the entire value chain in Africa, and that's a challenge. So you have a lot of startups that are overbuilding because they can't work together. So they have to build their own uh, auditing systems, to give credit, then they have to build their own solutions to connect to telcos, then they have to build this other thing. And that has meant, therefore, that startups in Africa are actually nowadays more expensive than we think. So take a good look at VC returns. We already begin to see data that suggests that the startup ecosystem in Africa is not cost competitive. And a lot of the initial value proposition to the rest of the world was that you can actually do things cheaply in Africa that you can't do in Europe. So I think going to AI, if we take the same approach, and it's much more expensive to build AI systems in Africa than elsewhere, we should forget it. We can do all the regulations we want. Nobody's going to come in and invest because it's too expensive to build AI here. So those are my four systematic ways of thinking about the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bright. I think our panelists also, you know when you have a panel and you don't have to ask questions and they're just bouncing off each other? This is how I hope we will be building innovation on the African continent because we truly can bounce off each other. So, um, oh, the screen's gone off, but I think we've got 15 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, I would like to open it up for audience questions. I do not want to hog the mic. Is there anyone with a question? So we've got three. I will start. We'll, shall we, is it okay if we do take all the questions? Round of three, panelists. Great. Uh, let's go. We'll start with the gentleman over here. I acknowledging the um, moderator over here and uh, the person at the back there. Hello, my name is um, Maxwell Biganim, and I'm from Ghana. Uh, I want to take this uh, from a different perspective, though it wasn't at this, but I would want to see understanding the structural intervention in AI with situating it in an environmental sustainability context. As Africans, how then do we narrow the conversation towards that? Because I am a climate activist and an environmentalist, so I would want to understand so that we can, the gap that exists, we can um, start having conversations within and that ecosystem. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chennai. Um, Koliwe from Mozilla. So I've got three very broad questions, and I think, um, oh, so I have, um, oh, no. Okay, let me choose. Um, where, where, so when we talk about the industry in Africa, who are we talking about? I think Pumzile made reference to it, Bright did and so did Sean. Because when, uh, coming from the layman's point of view, I see Africa's economy as largely informal, informal trading. So even when you talk about the startups and investing, who exactly are we talking about? Um, the last question is, <laughs> <laughs> does all AI have to be introduced to solve a problem? Can we get to a point where we have AI that is about our well-being and whose utility is felt because we just want something fun. Does it always have to be public interest technology? Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Abilo. I'm a former Tech and Society Fellow. And part of some of the work we did was also analyzing AI systems, such as how people could sort of gamify um, um, uh, algorithms on Twitter so that they trend and stuff like that. And one thing that I feel like people don't mention enough when it comes to AI is um, the dark holes that is open source. And one of the things that happened um, in recent times is that Facebook released um, their own sort of transformer model called Llama. And they gave it out for free as opposed to companies like um, ChatGPT who sort of try to hide um, the data that they've even used to train their models. And this sort of led to a seismic shift in AI, in a sense where people are even deploying, deploying their own artificial systems models um, on mobile devices. People are now running AI systems on laptops. And it's sort of democratizing the process in which people can deploy these AI models. And I'm just wondering from a regulatory perspective or policy perspective, how can you sort of regulate people who are essentially going to be developing and deploying these platforms on their own volition, on their own devices? Like how would regulation work from a perspective like that one? Yes, we're going to take one each. Thank you so much for the fantastic questions. And though some people cheated with two, we appreciate uh, the Mozilla way of, uh, you know, b building our own parts. Um, so, Pumzila, I think I saw you react to question one. Go ahead. Both questions. I'm also cheating. So, I think environmental sustainability. So, when I was talking about human well-being as an ethical question, that is important. Um... So I've been thinking about this for a while. So how do we infuse ethics and deciding values? I think it's a very contextual issue. Um, and I think for Africa, if we had to kind of agree on a, on a value that Africans find important, it's Ubuntu. Um, I think everyone knows what Ubuntu is. So I've been thinking about it um, because we could have asked the platforms to say, you guys, you need to decide on your ethics. Um, I know the Institute for Electri Electoral Engineers, they've got an ethnical centered design framework, which I think is a great intervention. So there's a way, so we need to find a way where we can say, have those ethics, and then find a way of 
infusing accountability. So perhaps the question is, instead of having regulation and laws after solutions have been built, we need to talk about ethical digital design legislation. And that doesn't have to be complex. Um, it does not have to think of every single technological solution. And it's just like a broad framework of values. Um, human rights, transparency, open source. Um, so I think that's, that's a solution. And then in terms of the... Lep, I'm going to own the mic. Thank you so much. I will pass it on to... The joy of MozFest is you can get names and have tea time and dance together tonight, weather permitting. But thank you so much, Pumzile. Um, uh, so, does anyone else want to take another question? Sean? <laughs> we'll just go down and then come back to Bright. Sean, is there a question you want to um, respond to? Yeah, I think the question of, but who is, who is the industry? And that's, and that's an important one. And so, I think, first and foremost, we need to do more in the continent to coordinate the effort around developing an industry and a response. As much as I say we've got to try to create representative data infrastructure. I think also we need to start developing solutions in Africa, AI related, because all of these, are, all of the solutions seem to be driven by big tech companies. And at the moment we are only thinking of AI as those solutions that are coming from the big tech. But uh, I mean, like as in, in response to the question, how do you regulate individuals? To pick up from Pumzile, I think that we need guidelines. We need guidelines from the software development perspective. There is, it's gonna be difficult to police because at the moment in the, US, um, in the US governance process, the big techs right now are arguing for a loophole that will allow them not to abide by some of the guidelines in the, in the design process. So I think it is possible to create design uh, guidelines. It is, it is difficult to police them though but we can easily, easily do that. And, um, and, and we can find codes, because there are codes in place at the moment. And if you create a kind of a body of, like any accredited body of professionals who have to subscribe to codes, we can create such a way of regulating people who are involved in AI design, including independent individuals or smaller companies and the like. Thank you. So much, Sean. Uh, I see the trick you did there was just answering the questions anyway. <laughs> Forms left future notes, but thank you so much for that intervention. I actually want to come to Bright and then I'll come to you, Bridget. Um, any question you want to take on? Uh, yes, I mean, quickly, I think on sustainability, there are two ways you can look at it. One is that because AI allows us to process so much more data, we're going to process so much more data, which, has a, which means that the compute environment is going to be much more energy intensive. And we're already seeing that the carbon cost of training some of these models keep rising. So if Africa could demonstrate cost competitiveness in sustainable energy, then you could make the case that some data centers, which are AI specialized, some of these NVIDIA you know, chip-based kind of things that are coming up, uh, can relocate to Africa because we have cheap geothermal in Kenya or whatever. So it's, you cannot divorce that from economic policy generally. The second aspect of sustainability that you can look at is what I often call the tension between transparency and translucence. One of the promises of AI is that every data set will be analyzed. And it doesn't matter what you are doing, the data will go somewhere to be analyzed. That creates immense transparency. In some aspects of sustainability, that is great. So if I want to find out the deforestation rate in Kenya, I don't have to go and ask the ministry. I'll use satellite data and then some compute system will figure that out and say this is the actual deforestation rate, this is the carbon credits you are, you are deserving. The problem is that sometimes that can rob agency because there's interpretation behind. If you don't understand the history of how deforestation works in Kenya, you can't understand how that really means. So the context. And that contextual element means that we don't need total transparency. What we need is translucence, a certain degree of transparency in AI. And I think that calculation around transparency versus translucence is going to be very interesting going forward on how AI plays there in sustainability. Yeah, so what I will say is that one of the biggest solutions that we can look at whenever we think about structural interventions is building human rights-based structural interventions as opposed to risk-based ones. 
because the reality is that most of the interventions that we have right now are conceived from a risk-based perspective. And even, you know, a really interesting thing happened in the EU quite recently with the building of the AI Act. And um, there's a little loophole now that enables the people who are building these very systems to decide for themselves whether their system is high risk or low risk. Very dangerous, right? Um, but if we build in human rights respecting policies into our work, it becomes much easier for us to then intervene whenever something goes wrong. Because the reality is that AI is extremely unpredictable. It's inherently discriminative. You can't change that. And so one of the ways, and especially even as we're talking about how do we regulate individuals, because it's, it's very hard to like focus on every single person's device, what are they doing with their device, what are they building on their device, what are they deploying. But if there are guidelines, as, as Sean has mentioned, and these guidelines must be human rights based, not risk based, then we definitely stand a better chance as, you know, as to intervening before things get out of hand. I, I cannot because the clock is counting down and uh, I believe the beauty of Mozilla is we continue these conversations in these spaces and there are so many panels that we are, and I, I look forward to joining your panels, Sean, um, and then we can have these conversations. So to close off, I'm going to ask, consider it a challenge to the panelists to, gi to give us one word, one, no cheating, one word of hope. What is your one word of hope that you would like for us to live with as we think about structural interventions? And I'll start with Bright. And end up oh. Serendipity. Activism. Hyphenated <laughs> data equality. Accountability. They did it, they did it, they rose to the equation, they hyphenated and they did it. Thank you all so much for this riveting conversation. Wow, wow, wow. Um, we will be back at 2 p.m. here for the Data Futures Lab showcase and you do not want to miss it because people are gonna be winning prizes and you know how we do. Um, and there's also going to be an audience vote, so we need you all in the room. A special thanks to the production team behind the scenes and our fantastic panelists. Thanks, everyone.